mathematical physicist is an individual who has lost the capacity to distinguish fact from fiction. He has been conditioned to doubt intuition and common sense at all costs and can no longer grasp the most obvious things in nature. You ask a mathematician to draw a circle and he scribbles variables and numbers. You ask him, what is your position on this matter? And he replies with an ordered pair. Or he points to a string of a kite and tells you that you are staring at a one-dimensional line. It is barely possible to communicate with such an autistic individual. So one wonders what intellectual standing the mathematicians have to interpret the workings of the universe. This is a myth. In fact, the mathematicians are the wrong people to be investigating the nature of light, the atom, and fields, especially when they openly confess that they have abandoned these pursuits. The mathematicians have been conditioned to believe that it is impossible to imagine a three-dimensional object such as an atom and routinely delegate such matters to the philosophers. The trouble is that philosophy is not investigating them either. No one is. Therefore, it should not surprise you when theorists and researchers have trouble answering the most basic of questions. For instance, the Stanford Linear Accelerator site defines a proton as a hadron, where a hadron is any particle made of quarks and gluons. It defines an electron as one of the fundamental particles and a particle as a subatomic object. Journals and popular science magazines routinely claim that researchers have photographed and manipulated individual atoms. The scholars also boast that they have split the atom and, certainly, before you split an egg, you must point to the egg. So ask a particle mathematician to draw one hydrogen atom for you. Now how difficult can this be? They've been playing around with atoms at the accelerators for over 80 years now. If an atom consists of one proton and one electron, a kindergartner should be able to draw an atom for you. However, a grown-up mathematician pen named Saxman822, who claims to work in high-energy experiments, tells me that he doesn't have the foggiest idea what the simplest of atoms looks like. Exasperated, he yells, Stop asking me to draw it! So I ask him to clarify, in the alternative, which of the two models Quantum advertises is the correct one. Is an electron a particle that orbits the proton as required to explain electricity and ionization? Or is it a balloon that encapsulates the nucleus as required to explain bonding and hybridization? Saxman shouts, Neither, neither, neither! So why can't he draw his version of one electron and one proton? Because I don't have a degree in graphic design. Professor of Chemistry Stephen Kukulich from the University of Arizona doesn't do much better. He tells me that despite his extensive experience, he doesn't know what an atom looks like either. But if I want to know what a real atom looks like, I will just have to make an appointment with one of his colleagues. My colleague, Andre Senov, actually collects the data to construct real pictures of real atoms. So how many more decades will we need to collect data to be able to sketch a proton and an electron? Of course, I'm still waiting for the first real picture of a real atom to appear on my fax. Professor Emeritus Robert Keane of the University of Houston gives me a different excuse. I've never seen a single electron. This is a conceptual issue. It does not require an experiment. Professor Keane just needs to resolve the discrepancy between the orbiting bead and the encapsulating balloon. Another individual known as the Rhino Hammer writes that... All evidence so far suggests a sizeless electron. Well, this certainly explains why Professor Keene was never able to see an electron in his 40 years of research. The problem is that the no-size electron is a self-contradiction, even under the unscientific operational definition of the word object used in quantum mechanics. Object. That which is physically observable. Professor Gideon Rosen of Princeton University confirms that this observable criterion is quite popular in the establishment. Do electrons have a shape? Do atoms have a shape? The surface of an atom is standardly defined as 95% boundary surface. That is, the region in which the outer valence electrons have a 95% probability of being located if they are localized by an observation. The rhino hammer concedes that the definition is circular because the words physical and object are synonyms but he fails to explain how you are supposed to observe a zero-size object. Yet this fanatic defender of the faith wants you to believe that electromagnetic force emanates from a zero-size particle. 
Such breathtaking replies and evasives from all corners of the establishment compel us to distinguish clearly between science and religion and put quantum mechanics in its proper place. The mathematicians who claim to work with zero-sized particles are no different than the weavers who went through the motions of making a robe for an emperor with inexistent thread. Let's start by defining the word supernatural. A supernatural explanation is one in which the relevant object and participants can be illustrated, yet the mechanism is not logically or physically possible. For instance, the theory that God made the universe can be illustrated. What cannot be rationalized is God making the universe in zero time, without moving an atom in his body. How do we get from the frame where nothing exists to the frame where something exists without any motion? Let's now distinguish between supernatural and irrational. An irrational explanation is one where the theorist cannot even make a movie of his proposal. There are two reasons for this. Either the proponent is attempting to move an abstract concept, or he attempts to pass an abstract concept for a physical object, a sleight of hand known as reification. Supernatural and irrational explanations have no place in science. They belong exclusively to religion. Quantum zero-sized particle is a classic example of irrationality. A mathematician claims on the one hand that an object is that which you can physically observe. On the other, he claims that an electron is a zero-sized object. Then he tries to convince you that scientists have accelerated this non-entity along a beam line. But if the zero-sized particle of quantum mechanics is mind-boggling, the explanations the mathematicians offer for nuclear and gravitational attraction are simply hilarious. In quantum mechanics, if you want the white cue ball to attract the black eight ball, you just have to place a negative sign in front of an equation. The only requirement quantum has is that a particle deliver negative momentum. The best description of what happens in a quantum field theory is that the exchange particle carries negative momentum. That's not an easy thing to visualize. If the momentum transferred by the wave points in the direction from the receiving particle to the emitting one, the effect is that of an attractive force. My god, what have they done to physics? In video number 9, we explain how one magnet physically attracts another. In the next two videos, we will explain how the sun physically attracts the earth. You should keep in mind that quantum has failed to incorporate gravity within the theory. So the question you should ask a particle mathematician is, how does quantum ever intend to produce attraction between two discrete particles, especially if neither of them has any size? By the way, Anderson's tale had a happy ending, which was never published. It turns out that the king took each of his counselors, one by one, into a back room and asked them to draw a picture of the robe. If the exasperated courtier shouted back, Stop asking me to draw it! The king would order his henchman to cut off that astrologer's head. When he was finished with his cabinet, the king knighted the two tailors and made them his new ministers.